All right, why don't we talk about action methods. So we talked about our getters, we talked about our setters, we talked about properties which are available to us. Now let's talk about action methods. As we mentioned earlier, there are many different components available to you to call your action methods. Uh, here is a partial list. These have action attributes which identify the method that we would like to call. Now, the way that action methods control navigation is through page references. And a page reference is a class and its purpose is to represent a location that we would like to send our users. Now there's a number of different ways to create page references. Here are a few ways to create page references. The, the first is you can create a page. There's an Apex Pages class and it has a method called current page. So if you want to obtain a reference to the current, in other words, the called uh, visual force page, you can do Apex Pages dot current page. Now you have an instantiated page reference for that. In addition, let's say you want to send the user onto a different location. So another visual force page. In that case, what we would do is we would use the page dot and then the name of our visual force page. So we would re return that as a part of our action method. Now, what if we want to send uh, an end user to something like the reports tab? Maybe we want to send them to the home tab or the chatter landing page. Well, in that case, we would need, none of those are visual force pages. We can create a partial URL to a location within the Salesforce app. In that case, we're just doing a string starting with a forward slash and then uh, sending the user onto that location. The last option we have is the ability to forward them on to some other system. So whether we want to send them to something like uh, Google or we want to send them someplace uh, like an internal application, it might be on the internet, it might be on the internet, but we can build up a full URL and uh, uh, instantiate a page reference and return that to uh, forward them to that location. There's an option that you have available when you're returning either the current page or another visual force page, which is you have the ability to either do a redirect or the ability to forward the user. Now the great thing about forwarding the user is that you maintain the state, and I'll talk about view state later on uh, tomorrow morning, uh, but with forward you can maintain the state. In the case of uh, doing a redirect, it's just going to uh, instruct the browser to do a fresh HTTP GET, and what that does is it flushes out the state, the current state of that user's interaction with the controller. Uh, so in the case of, like I said, in the case of the current page, or in the case of another Visual Force page, we have that option to flush it with the redirect or not. Now otherwise, if we're talking about other locations within Salesforce, so partial URLs, or if we're talking about full URLs, then we're definitely going to have to do a redirect because, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, that's the way that we, we get to those locations and there is no state being maintain, maintained between your Visual Force controller and let's say the reports tab, okay? All right, here we have a pretty simplistic controller and you'll notice that it has an action method. I know it's an action method because it returns a page reference. What we do is we instantiate this partial URL. We're going to redirect the user over to that page, uh, the standard page layout for viewing an account record, which is salesforce.com slash and then the record ID. But the key thing is right here on line 11, we are returning that page reference. Now, there's another option which is available to you, and we saw this earlier, and I just want to point this out. You'll notice that within our action method called do search, you'll notice that we are returning null. So in that case, this is actually the preferred, this is how you should keep a user on the current page, okay? Uh, you should not be returning apex pages dot current page because that's then generating a new uh, visual force page. 
Instead, you want to uh, return null, and then that will leave the person on the current page. Okay. Uh, the other thing that I will show you later on is that we have another option for returning paid references. So in addition to returning null and these four options, we can also return a call to another controller's action method. When we do that, because we're returning a call to another controller's action method, what does that action method return? It returns a paid reference. So think of it this way. We can return uh, a call to another action method. We essentially hand control over to that other controller. It then does its logic, whatever that may be, like for instance, saving a record to the database. And then depending upon how it's set up, it will then forward the user to some other location. Okay? Uh, we'll take a look at an implementation of that later. All right. Now, on a page reference, there are a number of things that you can set and access. There's the get parameters. Get parameters is the mechanism by which we access the uh, parameters, whether it's the HTTP query string parameters, or for that matter, we can access the contents of a form that was submitted up to the server. But get parameters is most commonly used to access HTTP query string uh, parameters. So normally what you're doing, and I'm going to jump back to a previous slide to show you an example of using that. Remember I said don't look at line 7. So here's line 7. What we're doing is we're doing a SQL query, and then it says where ID equals, and we have colon, apexpages.currentpage, dot get parameters, so return for me a map of all of my HP query string parameters, and specifically I'm looking for the value of the ID, okay? So uh, what we've done here is anytime that we have a query string parameter up there that might be set from a, you know, a link from a formula field or some other location. We can simply access that using this apex pages current pages, get the map of parameters, and then access that specific value. Okay? In this case, what we're doing is we're using it for the purpose of doing a database query to go out and find a record. So if you think about the standard controller and the way that it works, it has that logic to aut automatically look for that ID parameter and use that to query the database to, to, to get that record. All right, so let's jump back to our action methods and continue talking about that. There are other things that you can access on a page reference. Uh, so one of the things you can access is if you instantiate, let's say, a page reference referencing a, uh, a Visual Force page, you can actually force Salesforce to essentially generate it, and then you could access the generated HTML content or uh, something like the generated PDF content. So one of the things we have the capability to do uh, in our Visual Force pages is, uh, if you remember, there's the render as attribute on a page tag. We can set that equal to PDF. And so one of the things that people will sometimes do is in their Apex code, uh, generate a reference to, for instance, a page that renders as a PDF. So what we can do is we can uh, get the binary data that represents the contents of that PDF and then possibly store it as an attachment within the database. Okay. We can uh, also get at the URL, so there's a number of things. There's also setters associated with these. Okay. Some golden rules about development of your controllers. There's no guaranteed order of execution if you have multiple getters or multiple setters. So uh, don't make any assumptions that getter1 will be called before getter method2. You just don't know. Okay. Uh, so you can do things like make sure that inside, you know, check for null, check to see if something's been done. If it hasn't, call the other one, you know, stuff like that. But don't rely on an order of execution. Now, when we're talking about different types of methods, you can assume that when your action method executes, your setters have already executed, right? So when, we, when our users submit a form up to the server, 
setters get called before our action methods. So that's a safe assumption. But you don't know between different setter methods. Apex classes are just that. Uh, our controllers are Apex classes, and therefore we can apply with sharing or without sharing, and therefore apply the sharing model when accessing the database. Keep in mind that one of the things that folks do to protect access to their Visual Force pages and their applications is they restrict access to the Visual Force pages based on pro profile. Okay, So it's something that's available for you because Theoretically, someone could go into their URL in their browser and type in the location of your Visual Force page uh, and then access, conceivably, access your Visual Force page. By not enabling it on the profile level, we can now uh, prevent them from being able to access that. Right? All right, let's talk about some of the classes, some of the standard system classes that you use with your Visual Force controllers. The first one is Apex Pages message. What this does, this is a class that represents a message that we would be displaying on a page. So I mentioned how we have the page messages tag. Well, we can programmatically in Apex control whether we want to display an info message or we want to display a warning message or a fatal error, something along those lines. And we can set that by creating a new Apex message, adding it to the page. And we can set the severity level, and then the summary is the actual text that we want to display. Select option is another case where we need to have a class. And the reason is, is that with select option, there's the label, which is what we display, and then there's the value that gets posted up to the server. So the label is intended to be multilingual. So depending upon the user's language settings, we display different, uh, different labels. But the value being posted up to the server will always be, be the same. With the select option class, we can do that and then utilize it with things like select checkbox, select radio, select list. Okay. Here we are instantiating a new select option. And what we would do is set the value and then the label. We might use our schema described to uh, set that. Uh, and then we can get and set it later on if we'd, we'd like to do that. Here's an example of populating a list of select options. So here what we're doing is we're probably using the apex colon select options tag inside of our page. And what this does is it generates, in this case, all of the North American countries, uh, generates the, the labels and the, the values that will get posted. Now in the real world, you probably want to use metadata to generate the labels um, so that we can have multilingual uh, uh, multilingual labels. I'm going to come back to this later because we're going to be working on a lab on this, uh, but we're not going to do it till tomorrow morning. So I'll come back to uh, custom object wrappers uh, and their use in Visual Force controllers. Okay. One of the things that you might wonder is how do I override an action, like let's say save. How do I override the save method in a controller extension associated with, let's say, a standard controller? Okay. The way that this works is that you are going to code a save method in your controller extension. But it's a little bit tricky, and the reason it's a little bit tricky, I'm going to go back a bunch of slides back to where we were talking about setting the controller extensions. So right here on this slide, we have our controller extensions listed. We're using the standard controller for a contact. The way that I would override the save method is to create inside my controller extension a method called save. OK? Very, very simple, simple way to do that. Now, the problem is, notice that we have two extensions. Well, what if both Apex classes have a save method? On top of that, the standard controller has a save method. So uh, which one and how are they going to get called? If both controller extensions have a save method and a user clicks on something like a command button, which is bound to the save action method, we're going to look for a save method in the first listed controller extension. If we find a save method there, that is the save method that we're going to call, and we're only going to call that. 
If we don't find a save method in the first listed controller extension, what we're going to do is we're going to look in the second controller extension. If we find it there, we call that and only that. If we don't find it in either of these two classes, we then go to the standard controller, or for that matter, the custom controller, and look for it there. OK? All right. So I'm going to go back to my, uh, where I dropped off. So if you have multiple extensions, we look in the first listed class for the method, and then we keep looking until we find it. All right? All right, so let's, let's talk about in more detail those controller extensions. So how do controller extensions work? So remember that we use controller extensions anytime we want to add new functionality or override existing functionality. The way that controller extensions work, so first of all, this is a class which is a controller extension. Notice it is not extending anything. What we do in a controller extension is we define a constructor. We define a constructor that is passed a reference to the controller that it is extending. Okay. So what happens here is that uh, when uh, someone requests that page which has the uh, extensions reference, what's going to happen is there it's going to instantiate the standard controller, do what it does, and then pass a reference over to our controller extension. Now, in this case, we're working with the standard controller. And the standard controller has a number of different methods associated with it. So for instance, uh, the standard controller has uh, action methods. So it has save, quick save, view, delete, cancel. Uh, I always seem to forget one, edit. Uh, so we can call any of, those, any of those action methods. It also has methods for accessing the data so there's things like get ID, which simply returns the ID of the record that you're working with. And then there's get record. Get record is uh, really nice because uh, let's say that a user is using a controller extension associated with a standard controller. We're going to want to use the setters in the standard controller. So a user fills out a form. They click on an action method. And let's say that the action method is uh, defined within our controller extension. The data will be uh, submitted up to the standard controller. It will call and use the setters for there. What happens with our controller extension is that we have a reference to that record that we can then utilize. So what we can do with this reference, so here we have a local variable called uh, ACCT we would have uh, gotten an object-oriented reference to that record by calling get record. And now we have this around so that we can use the setters in the standard controller in order to access the data on that record. This is the magic behind our controller extensions. We define local variables so that we can keep the reference around after the constructor has completed running. But we now have a reference to that account. Now we can do things like, for instance, down here on line 7, access the value of the name field of that account. Okay. The way that we would reference this in our page is here we have our standard controller account. And extensions equals the class that we were just looking at. Okay.